Last week we looked at those feelings of shame that so often drag us down and how we were able to break free from them. This week I want to look at shame's twin, feelings of guilt. Now we know that when we claim Jesus as our Redeemer we were forgiven. However, I suspect, given human nature, that does not necessarily mean that we are free from feelings of guilt. It may well be that intellectually we can acknowledge that we are forgiven, but in the inner recesses of our heart, guilt still lingers. Can we find a path or a process that will enable us to break free from the feelings of guilt which continually plague humanity? Does the Bible clearly spell out a way in which we can functionally and effectively eradicate these feelings of guilt? Time will not permit us to cover all the Bible references on this subject. Suffice to say that both the Old and New Testaments deal effectively and conclusively with the subject. As our opening song reminded us, By God's word at last my sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. The catalyst in removing those feelings of guilt can only be found in God's forgiving nature. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This verse highlights the importance of confessing our sins to God. When we do so, he promises to forgive us and cleanse us, which can alleviate feelings of guilt. If we are unable to have a secure belief in the fact that forgiveness as an integral part of the character of God, we may never be free from feelings of guilt. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains.
There is a crimson stream of God's forgiveness running through the Old Testament alone, with over 150 references. Consequently, we cannot just ignore this and think that God's forgiveness is more New Testament theology. Rather, it speaks to us of the very essence of the character of God. Bible writers found it not only necessary to continually emphasise the forgiveness of God, but also to engage in linguistic colour and illustration to make their point. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Come now, let us settle the matter says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red, Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Though your sins be as scarlet, though your sins Scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They shall be as white as snow. Hear the voice that entreats you, O return ye unto of grace he is a great compassion and of wondrous love hear the voice that entreats you hear the voice that entreats you oh return Unto me, look unto me, ye people, saith the Lord your God. He'll forgive your transgressions, he'll forgive your transgressions and
Forgiveness is an amazing act of God's grace to forget forever and not hold those who have confessed and sought forgiveness accountable for their sins. It's God's gracious act of putting believers back in a right relationship with him and resolving their guilt. Getting forgiveness in all its totality is a personal experience that comes from believing and accepting what God has done for us. Warren Weasby says, Forgiveness is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performs. It meets the greatest need, it costs the greatest price, and it brings the greatest blessing and the most lasting results. God's unalterable words are found within the pages of the Bible, and they are the only real evidence of forgiveness and guilt elimination. The writer of Psalms comes to understand the entirety of God's forgiveness when he writes, As far as the east is removed from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions, that is, our sins, from us. Now, this issue of forgiveness is a difficult one to get our heads around. God is just, and matters of the moral law he cannot break. Sin has to be punished, and there is no way around the issue. The one and only remedy to the dilemma was that God himself must take the punishment, and only a sinless sacrifice would resolve the situation. God's plan of salvation to rescue doomed sinful humanity was to give his own son as a once and for all sinless substitute for the sins of all humanity. Arise, my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fears, the bleeding sacrifice on my behalf appears. Before the throne my surety stands, my name is written on his hands. The book of Hebrews has clear and direct guidance when it comes to what is needed to free ourselves from feelings of guilt. It encourages us to boldly draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse from a guilty conscience. This infers 
that faith plays a crucial role in overcoming feelings of guilt. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Into this royal throne room of God we come without pretense, shame or guilt. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. There is no fear of condemnation, no blame or punishment. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? But God can be trusted to keep his promise. The Bible tells me so, and my experience of his goodness personally affirms this to be true. Our part is to hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, and this promise and hope is for every living human being. James Barker was the pioneer of Real Salvation Army Social Services, founding the Army's first prison and court service in Melbourne. He was a man with a very practical view of Christianity and was reported to have uttered this famous quote about the most holy place. By all means aim for heaven, but take a thief with you. Whence to me this waste of love, ask my advocate above. See the cause in Jesus' face, now before the throne of grace. Depth of mercy, can there be mercy still reserved for me?
If we are to be truly cleansed and freed from any feeling of guilt, we need something that is beyond the capacity of mere fallible humanity, and such a power can only be found in the blood Jesus shed on the cross. As difficult as that may be to comprehend, it is a fact that we must grasp in faith. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? One of the failures of the Old Covenant was that it was, in a sense, surface cleansing capable only of removing the ceremonial uncleanness but leaving the inner person guilt-stained. It was possible to be ceremonially clean but yet still riddled with guilt. Under the new covenant, the cleansing reaches beyond the surface of the ceremonial and cleanses the heart and mind of guilt. There is no comparison between the efficacy of the two covenants. The old with its surface rinsing and the new with its targeted deep cleansing. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify. All too often in the rush and pressure of modern life, we are just content to rinse off the surface grime of sin that daily living brings and leave the deep-seated stains of guilt that perhaps need deeper attention. Let me return to where we started today. If we are unable to have a secure belief in the fact that forgiveness is an integral part of the character of God, we may never be free from feelings of guilt. Perhaps the most powerful and fundamental parable Jesus told was that of the lost son in which the character and person of God is reflected in the Father. It seems to me that Jesus is wanting us to understand the innate character of a God whose heart was the very essence of love, compassion and forgiveness. God's deepest desire is that we should not carry unnecessary feelings of guilt. And the parable of the lost son gives us an insight into the depths of God's heart of forgiveness. 
A little while back, the song The Goodness of God became quite popular, and in general, I like the song. However, my 20th century Salvation Army mind found the line that says, Your goodness is running after, it's running after me, somewhat jarred with me, and I dismissed the song as one I probably wouldn't use. However, in thinking about this parable of the lost son and the father's reaction to the return of the son, this line seems to fit perfectly. I love you, Lord. For oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake Till I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so Now, we know most of us sincerely believe that because of our faith in the redemptive death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we are forgiven. However, that may not mean that we are free from feelings of guilt. 
There is a crimson stream of God's forgiveness running throughout the Bible and we have to intentionally and consciously assimilate it into our own spiritual life. True freedom from feelings of guilt can be ours through the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. Ours is the responsibility to take God at his word and claim that freedom from guilt. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price, it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to his. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Make you fishes of men. 